thanks Harold for uh, or Stephen <laughs> <coughs> senior elder junior elder huh well thanks for helping out this morning <clears throat> and of course we uh, it's vacation time and I know we have a lot of people on vacation and some with uh, other situations going on and how unreal is it that Pam would be visiting her sister-in-law and she passes away. I mean, that's, maybe she's supposed to be there for helping out, but uh, still it's kind of, kind of a hard one to grasp. But I'm on vacation also, so you can all go home and, <laughs> we'll, oh, and actually I have nine more weeks, <laughs> so I get that, that whole summer off and uh, I enjoy it. But never really on vacation there's always something to do whether you're working for somebody or for yourself would like for you to turn to Colossians that's where we're going to be for a few moments this morning we share together let God's word speak to us and this has been a, uh, a, a fitful week of preparation because I wasn't quite sure where to go there's so much and yet you think we've been through all this so many times and yet uh, you go back and there it is and it's uh, popping out at you some new stuff and so I thought I would uh, go back and share some things to you from Colossians so open to chapter 1 and uh, Paul as you know here writing this epistle this document of the New Testament uh, was in prison in Rome and as in many cases he he wrote his epistles from prison not always in the happiest of places but uh, he took advantage of it and considered himself the prisoner of the Lord not of Rome prisoner of the Lord the Lord had him there for a reason. And as we unfold the epistles of Paul written from prison, we begin to realize that guy that was so ambitious and running all over the countryside all the time wouldn't have had much time to write had he not been there. But of course, uh, beyond that, he was in prison because of what he was preaching, of what he was teaching, the grace of God hard for the world to grasp that and especially after the crucifixion of Christ who was crucified by religious leaders who again would not accept the fact that he God in the flesh was there to deliver them and bring them their kingdom and that of course would take power away from them and they would not have that so things have never really changed I would imagine and have imagined many times if he were to walk down Main Street, Louisville, in the flesh as he did in Jerusalem, would probably uh, meet up with pretty much the same reaction. Let's get him out of here because he's going to pull away the power and the great pension plan and insurance and living expenses I'm getting paid by being in the pulpit and preaching what they tell me to preach pretty much the same thing. So when we get to Colossians, there's Paul uh, writing this great epistle to the church. There was a church at Colossians, and it's believed that Paul had not ever really been to Colossae. That uh, this Epaphras uh, that we see here in verse 7, as he also learned of Epaphras, Epaphras our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ? Apparently, Epaphras, having come to the Lord and learned about the message of grace along the line, had uh, started this group of believers studying the Word of God rightly divided at Colossae. Um, Paul's introduction, as in all of his epistles, are of praise. Although there's a difficulty, there's a problem here in this church. As you know that uh, Paul, in 
his epistles was writing to the Roman church in doctrine, sending them doctrine. Then to the Corinthians, reproof because they had problems. And then Galatians, correction. It was doctrine, reproof, correction. Correction in Galatians because they had taken the grace of God, according to the Judaizers that come up to them, said you have to add to your salvation, which you receive freely in Christ. You have to add to that. Maybe circumcision, maybe baptism, maybe this and that and so on and they were perverting the scripture so when you get to Colossians again you're in a book a uh, epistle of correction and why are they being corrected because he points out all these great things about them for for example um, let's start with verse 1 Paul an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the saints and faithful brethren. They're faithful. They're saints. How did they get to be a saint? Some church council somewhere high up say, you're good enough to be a saint all the way through. You go back to the Old Testament, you'll find that word saint all the way through the Bible. And especially in Paul's epistles where he writes to the saints that be at Rome, to Ephesus, to Corinth, Corinth and, and so on, to the saints. He's talking to us. Anybody who knows Christ as their Savior has become a saint, sanctified, set apart. That's what it means. Man cannot appoint saints. Only God does that. And he says, this is how you become a saint. You know Christ as your Savior, that's it. It's done, sealed. So he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith. So it's a good church. He heard of their faith. Wow, they got a lot of faith there in that church. They trust in the Lord. That's good. Also, he says, and of the love which ye have to all the saints. That was currently then they loved all the other saints in the church good things here. Faith, love. Also in verse 5, for the hope. They had the hope which was laid up for you in heaven. Well, things are going well the way it looks here. And he goes on to say in verse 5, of which he heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. So they had the gospel. They knew the gospel. According to Paul in the Corinthian letter, that is that Christ was crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected. They knew that. That's the gospel. So, what, what kind of uh, correction was Paul going to have to make here? Since they start out, everything sounds pretty good. They have faith. They have love. They have hope. They have the gospel. Um... And you, and you go on to, into the end of verse 6. He says, since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. So they know about the grace of God and the truth of the grace of God. Wonderful group of people. Wonderful letter. But still, there seemed to be a problem here because he's writing a, a letter of reproof, as we know, according to Paul's layout in the epistles. Well, if you go over, and we'll jump ahead for a minute, and point it out in chapter 2, if you look at verse 8. Chapter 2, verse 8. Paul goes on then to start his warnings. He says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit and the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Wow, amazing statement. But it appears, first of all, that there was a problem here with philosophy. Nothing wrong, you can have your own philosophy, that's okay, you're free to do that. Philosophy, the great philosophers of all time, uh, you 
can study and see what their take on the world and society and the universe is. But here it's a, it's a philosophy that was, was prominent in the world in those days, the philosophy of the Greeks. And of course the Romans had their philosophy too, but, but Greek philosophy was, was heavy duty. Um, it, it comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And there's nothing wrong with knowledge either. But philosophies about this and about that becomes a danger. And the philosophies of that time had begun to infect the people in this church. And it was it, it's always an attempt to get you away from Christ and the great knowledge of man. The knowledge of man will never save him. The knowledge of man and his, his ability to think and his ability to understand the world in his own way will never get you to heaven, will never bring you salvation. It's the knowledge of Christ. As you go on here, in verse uh, 8, he says, Beware lest a man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. The problem with the philosophies, and, and you can find philosophy about God and the universe throughout every culture and every generation, but the problem with it was that most of the philosophy being taught was that the human mind and the human spirit and the human being is greater than God. For example, the, uh, the uh, Hindus, and not to put down any group, but just I can tell you for a fact what, where they arrived to their conclusion about God. The Hindus, the Indians, will, back whenever it started, said that God is benevolent. There is a God. He's benevolent. He's gracious. He's giving. So therefore, God must be a cow. They looked at the cows and said, well, they seem to me to be like God must be. As a result, it's holy cow. They're worshiping the cow. They still do. Cows roam free and, of course, uh, aiding in the demise is having food and crops that let the cows roam free and eat whatever they want. But that philosophy has reduced the creator God into a cow. The American Indian, read back in their lore and history, and their spiritual beliefs. Uh, they would be, whichever Indian it first came from, I don't know, but they were in love with the eagle. They would stand out on the hillside and see the eagle, which is a beautiful creature, soaring and diving into the valleys and then soaring high into the sky to where you almost couldn't see them. I said, wow, that eagle is some creature, and look how it can fly high almost out of sight. The eagle must be God. So therefore, that philosophy developed into the American Indian worship of the eagle. And, uh, oh, the Egyptian. Go way back in Egyptian history and find out where their uh, philosophical beliefs took them. They... Uh, course had a lot of desert around they'd be walking through the desert and be out there in the uh, brilliant hot sun and experiences the heat and the burn and um, can't even look at it and therefore the sun must be God and so that Egyptian philosophy evolved into the sun God now that's human philosophy at its nth degree We've done better than that through history. But basically, that's how the human being thinks. In Romans 1, Paul writes that God had revealed himself in nature. And that's beautiful. Because that's all they had to see, to understand. He said, if, 
if they could look at the tree and look at the stars in the sky and realize that there had to be a creator behind that, then they were okay. It's only when the Gentile culture back in history, before Israel became a nation, took what they experienced in nature, the four-footed beasts and creatures, the animals and everything, instead of saying, God created this, let's build a statue of this and worship it. As a result, their downfall came from that instead of recognizing that the creator is God through what he had created. Anybody that looks at the universe or looks at the uh, nature around them, you have to say, well, I planted that petunia, but where'd the petunia come from? You know, there's got to be a, a greater mind than mine behind that petunia as you look at nature. But as centuries went on, God continued in, uh, to reveal himself more and more apart from nature himself with the nation Israel and then to the Messiah the promises of the Messiah and then to Christ himself and the crucifixion and the resurrection and he continued to reveal himself and then through the apostle Paul continued to reveal his completed word so you can look at nature and say well there must be a creator but where are you going to find out about him it's here not in philosophy this tells you God spoke and the worlds came into existence. So Paul begins to take his, his beautiful introduction of all the good things these people were doing at this Colossae church and then of course he tells them you guys are getting involved in this human philosophy and the philosophy of the day would say um, all matter is evil. You can read this in philosophy books. All matter is evil. Therefore, if God created matter, he must be evil also. And that's human philosophy. And that's what the Greek philosophers were teaching. Remember Paul went to Mars Hill? He went up the hill and he saw all these monuments and booths and carvings and statues to all different kinds of gods and then one which had no name because they thought well maybe there is another one we haven't thought of yet and Paul says I'm here to tell you about that one that you haven't thought of yet and uh, the great philosophers um, some of them believed some didn't, didn't and some when he told them about Christ and, and some said we'll hear more about this tomorrow in other words I'll wait and put it off a little bit and uh, we'll hear some more of you tomorrow he had that three categories some believed Paul was convincing about Christ God who came in the flesh but then there, you can read this in I think it's uh, Acts 18 in that area Paul going to Mars Hill and going to talk with all the philosophers and it, it's interesting that it said that uh, what will this babbler say? Let's hear what this babbler will say. And he told them, and it says some believed, others didn't, and some said we'll hear about it tomorrow maybe, come back. Putting it off. Well, that's the issue going on here at this church. Philosophy. And it was a problem because if all matter is evil, Therefore, the creator is evil. What kind of a God is that? An angry God. Can't hear us. Won't listen to us. Just going to bring judgment. That's human philosophy. This is what they were facing here. Not only uh, philosophy, but uh, tradition. You see it over in uh, verse 18 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, 18. Let no man beguile you in your reward of your reward in a voluntary humility of worshiping of angels intruding into those things which he hath not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from whom all the body and joints and bands have nourishment we know what he Christ is the head so here 
they had this voluntary humility. In other words, humble yourselves and worship the angels. Now, the philosophy also, Gnosticism, the Greek philosophy of Gnosticism, which is still around, it's right here today, believed that, believed in God, but they believed in angels. That, that's why Paul had this in here about involuntary worship of angels. Because the Gnosticism of the day had, of course, God, who was an angry God, because he's evil if he created matter which is evil. We're evil. All matter is evil. But there was the God in this philosophy, the Gnosticism, and had a whole ladder of angels down to us, whereby we had to work our way up through each angel to get to God. Very simple. But they also assigned Jesus Christ, whom they had heard about, to one of those angels. This was a problem infecting this church of believers in Colossae. They had traditions going on, which traditions are okay. We have traditions, but not if the tradition was wrong. So what does Paul do to counter this issue that was happening here? Because we know they're good people. They mean well, but they're being infected, invaded by this philosophy that Christ is only assigned to being one of those angels in that huge ladder that gets you to God, who's an angry God because he created matter and all matter is evil and he's evil. This is what they were faced. We sound, today sounds like that's kind of far out because we don't hear that today. In one form or another we do. In one form or another. So what does Paul do in opening up here to counter this before going after it before attacking the philosophy and the humility in voluntary and worship of angels and so on doesn't come right out and say don't do that he presents the Lord Jesus Christ and all of his glory first look how he does this Starting in verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Very interesting that the Greek word gnosis for knowledge is also in Paul's uh, verse 9. Desire that you might be filled with the knowledge. It's okay. Knowledge is fine. Nothing wrong with that. I'd, I'd love the space program. Without knowledge, where would that be? And just a side note, my uncle, who was career army, after the Second World War, when they brought Werner von Braun over to start our missile program here, my uncle worked directly with him, an enlisted guy. <laughs> he had to, apparently had some brains. It was very interesting. But... Paul here uses the same word, gnosis, but you're to have the knowledge and be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, what's his will? He always tells us. I'm always amazed at people who, boy, I'd love to know the will of God, but how do you know the will of God? How can you know? Well, it's all here. It's in his word. Nothing specific on your own that you want to do I got to go see if it's the will of God well how are you going to know unless you read it it's in his word so he says here that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will how are we going to do that what is his will in verse 10 that ye walk worthy of the Lord that's his will unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the gnosis the knowledge of God. We're to have the knowledge. We're to have the philosophy of God. We're to have the gnosis, which in Greek is knowledge, written in Greek here. 
There's his will. Now let's go on. Verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. That's continuing God's will. His will is that you be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, not any other power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. <coughs> In other words, it's not a drudgery. You shouldn't, shouldn't regard doing God's will as a job or a drudgery, but it's with all what? Joyfulness. Verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, this is continuing God's will, who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. So Paul starts out with a sevenfold process of salvation here, telling us through Christ, his will is that we know what he has given us through Calvary. Because Paul goes down later and look in verse 14. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. This is why you should walk worthy. Why? Because the redemption comes through him, forgiveness through his blood. And you might want to know if you already don't know it. In verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins has been severely altered in the modern translations. It reads in all, if it's that verse is even not even in some of them, but in most of the modern translations it will read, in whom we have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. And what's missing? The blood. The blood is, you can't have, the life is in the blood. You cannot have forgiveness without the sacrificial blood. And that, of course, was where? Calvary. That took place at Calvary. Paul's laid the groundwork. You want to know his will? Here's what it is. Walk worthy <laughs> in all wisdom and power. You got the word of God, you got the power. Because he's already delivered us in verse 13. And he goes on to tell us in these verses, you have inheritance, you have deliverance, you have been translated, you have redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation, and transfiguration. If you read through this rest of this chapter, those seven elements of the salvation process has been granted to us through the blood of Calvary. The groundwork is being laid for not the problem that's in that church. The groundwork is first you got to acknowledge what he has done for you in that great work of Calvary. And if you go through, we don't have time to do it all verse by verse, but seven points right here in this first little area. You have inheritance, deliverance, translation, redemption, forgiveness, reconciliation, and being transfigured. Wow. That's a lot. So Paul's letting you know, letting us know right away what Christ has done for us, what his will for us through that is, and the countermeasures to any cult or satanic activity or philosophy that may come into our being. He's laying this great groundwork. Now, here's, here's the real heavy-duty stuff. <clears throat> in verse 15, of course, in verse 14, he's talking about Christ who redeemed us through his blood, forgave us of sins. Now, in verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God? the firstborn of every creature. Now, Paul says, here is your Lord and Savior who shed his blood for our redemption, our forgiveness of sins. He is the image of God, the firstborn of every creature. Now, firstborn, we'll deal with that first. Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, of course, they believe Jesus is not God. 
they'll use this verse and say, see, he was born, so therefore he's not eternal. He's just like the rest of us. Of course he was born. Born of the Virgin Mary. He also was conceived by God the Holy Ghost. There was no man involved. And yes, he was born of the Virgin Mary without sin. Unlike us, born in sin, born with sin. David said, in sin my mother conceived me. Didn't mean she was a bad woman. May have been, but isn't what it means. Because of what Adam did, he inherited that disobedience and that sin, which, according to Paul in Romans, is passed on to us this day. Jesus was born, yes, but firstborn, not in the flesh, according to this. Firstborn because of priority. It's not chronologically firstborn. It's priority. If you go back to the Old Testament, you'll find it all the way through. Jacob was called the firstborn. But Esau was born before him, his brother. Esau was first. It's in the scripture. So we're not dealing with chronological here. We're dealing with priority. And through the Old Testament, you will find different ones where they're calling the second or third born the firstborn. Because he's he's going to inherit it all. He's priority, firstborn. He becomes firstborn. So you can use that for anybody comes knocking your door with a book in their hand and says, well, Jesus is not God. Paul's changing that around. He is. He is God. Let's uh, hold there and go back to John chapter 13. John's Gospel, chapter 13. <clears throat> It's very interesting because uh, in John 13 and in the other Gospels as well, um, Jesus was letting his apostles, his disciples know that he was going up to Jerusalem. He was going to be betrayed and he would be denied and he would go to Calvary and die and come back again the third day. And, of course, they never caught that. Should have known it through the prophecies, but they didn't get it, didn't want to. Couldn't imagine the thought of being without him in their midst. And so they weren't getting it. So look at verse uh, chapter 14. Oh, wait, I should, did I say 13? Um, okay, let's see. Chapter 13. Um, verse 31, chapter 13 of John, verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straight, straightway glorify him. Now, if you jump over to chapter 14, verse 1, Paul says, Don't be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, for in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may, ye may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, this was a great promise. Tell him again he's going to leave them. They can't go where he's going, but he's going to go prepare a place for them, and he's going to come again and take them up to be with him. Great promises. Now look at verse 5. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, how can we know the way? Has Thomas been around for a while? Or did you just forget what he's been hearing for three years? Anyhow, he says, how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. In verse 7, If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Well, we know from Scripture, no man can look upon God and live. A 
And yet Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen him. Paul writes in Colossians, the image of God. Yes, he's the image, God in the flesh. Didn't he write in uh, uh, First Timothy? Yeah, First Timothy. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh, seen of angels, believed on in the world. Great is the mystery of godliness. You bet, without controversy. Well, he, Jesus goes on here. Verse 7, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Who? The Father. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father. Can you believe this? It, it makes me feel kind of good, because any of the uh, uh, lacks of faith, or absence of faith, or ignorance that I may have, doesn't go much beyond Philip here. Being with him and seeing his miracles and his power, raising the dead, turning water to wine, walking on the water, uh, all of the great words and miracles and power and signs. And uh, Philip says, show us the Father. And right after Jesus has said, if you have known me, you should have known my Father also. Show us the Father. So Jesus answered and said, Have I been so long time with you? He has. And yet thou hast not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. And there's his description and explanation of himself. He said, you've seen my works. If you don't believe that I am God in the flesh for any other reason, believe on me for that. That I and the Father are one. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. And there was nothing made that wasn't made by him. And in verse 14 of chapter 1, we find the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God manifest in the flesh. So when Paul is beginning to get these people strengthened and knowledgeable before he launches into their issues... He lets them know that they're dealing with God in the flesh through his word, of course. So, verse 15, Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God. God's invisible, but we see him visible in his son. You can look upon the son. Now, verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. One of the most dynamic and amazing verses in the Bible, verse 17, he is before all things, and by him all things consist. He's the creator. Nothing made that wasn't made by him. Everything was made by him. Today, is today for him? Are we for him? All things were made by him and for him. Most church services around the world, I suppose, at least in my experience, start their service with Psalm 118, verse 24. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Rejoice and be glad in it. He has made all things. He made today. Made us today.
to be here today, those who of us of us who are here. He made the day, and guess what? For him. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Paul says all things are made by him. Principalities, powers, seats of government, government in the universe and the heavens, government of God, all things, you, me, today. This day was made for him. By him and for him, and by him all things consist. Now this this is the amazing verse that I thought about. Well, it means held together. I think we know that. <clears throat> All things are held together, consist by him. In other words, if he let go, oblivion. Now the amazing thing is that all things are made out of atoms. And I try to think back to, I think it was eighth grade or ninth grade science class where we studied the atom. I'm not sure what grade they study it in today. Could be college for all I know. But back then it was, I think, seventh grade. And it took a while to, to figure out what was going on about this atomic structure. Everything, according to what I learned, was consist of atoms, whirling, spinning atoms. The atom, which was apparently discovered way back in the 1800s, but more recently, fuller knowledge of it in 1911 by a New Zealander, um, discovered that this atom had a nucleus. Of course, you can't see it. Paul talks in Romans about the things that are invisible. That's invisible. But now with new electronic microscopes, atomic microscopes and so on, they can pretty much see what's happening. But in the nucleus of this atom are protons. And they're positively charged. And then you have neutrons and electrons going around that atom, which you can't see, but all this universe of this little thing you can't see is going on all the time. Now, in the nucleus of this atom are those protons that are positively charged. Now, this may sound too scientific, but to put it in simple terms, any of you remember the, the little black and white dogs that came with magnets on the bottom of them? Remember that? You old guys can remember that. I remember somebody telling me about it. <laughs> Anyhow, we had to, th there were toys, very little teeny, a, a white dog and a black dog, and they were attached to magnets underneath, and you could bump them up against each other and drag them around. It was fun. But if you took those two dogs and turned both magnets to the positive, you could put them together, but they'd immediately fly apart positive particle repel, negative attract. Within that nucleus of the atom are positive neutron, uh, protons, and all the science knows it, and they're not repelling. Science has had to say, well, they've come up recently with, it's a cosmic glue. Um, who's this guy? I had wrote this down to this one fellow. Oh, um, Ernest Rutherford, 1911, New Zealander. He said the nucleus is held together by a strong force. Um, of course, there have been a lot of new knowledge learned on the atom, and they've come up with quarks. I don't know what a quark is, and uh, quantum physics and all of that stuff, and you've got theories and uh, all kinds of ideas about the atom still going on.
that the guy in uh, 1911, Ruther Ernest Rutherford, New Zealand, said the nucleus is held together by a strong force. Yet these positive protons, uh, like the little dogs coming together with the positive ends toward each other, will push themselves apart. So he called uh, the reason they don't fly apart <coughs> in the nucleus is because of this strong force. And more recently, it's a cosmic glue, whatever that is. Now, I'm no scientist, and I don't claim to be too intelligent about all this stuff. But I do trust God's word and believe God's word. And if they don't really know, in the midst of all their theories, what holds that together? Because if it's not held together, guess what? Oblivion. Everything falls apart. The atom being the basic substance of all matter would fly apart. Um, go over to Second Peter a minute. Second Peter. Chapter 3, <clears throat> to the right of Colossians, 2 Peter, chapter 3. Now, <clears throat> Peter hears in this whole third chapter, is pretty dynamic, talking about the return of Christ and, and so on. Um, look at verse... Nine. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The idea there is that people are saying, Where's his return? We want to see him coming back. We want this to end. Life's not too good. The world is in a mess. The last days are upon us, and so on. Peter says, Every day that goes by, the day which the Lord hath made, every day that goes by that God doesn't put an end to it is another day of long suffering that all should come to repentance. Another day for you. Got another uh, little time. Peter says that. But he goes on in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are in it shall be burned up. Wow. Seeing then that all these things should be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, in which the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Well, if in Colossians 1 all things are for him and are held together by him, and it's called a cosmic glue or a great force, <laughs> if he lets it go, What do you have? The heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Keeping it all together. Why? Because God is long suffering. Another day. The psalmist said, For this is the day that the Lord hath made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Paul says everything was created by him and for him. This day is for him. This long suffering is for him. The redemption through Calvary from him for us. And he's holding it all together until. And you can put a question mark until. Whenever that is, he lets it go. Paul laid this down this strong, powerful verse 
and truth, I believe, that he holds it all together. To let them know how powerful he is being the creator that he's still holding it together for him. And you know what? He will hold our life together. You got problems or I got problems. You know somebody that's got problems. This dynamic verse could mean something to them. He'll hold your life together. I look back to Calvary. That uh, our Lord was on the cross. <clears throat> and you know the suffering he went through and the torture he went through and the mocking and the spitting upon him and on it goes. And from the there were three hours that darkness came upon the earth. Literally says the sun was darkened. Now that's a cosmic atomic nuclear element. Matter of fact, the creation of the world through philosophers came, according to science, 83.7 billion years ago when all of a sudden there was a big bang and the atom was created. Actually use that word, read it in science. The atom was created. On the cross, he still had it. He had a hold of it. But he was dying. What would happen if the creator who held everything together died? Would it begin to release? During three hours of darkness, we know that the Father was turning away as the sins of the world were pouring out upon him. And God's wrath, which was meant for us, was poured out upon him. The sun was affected. I can imagine the confusion of the birds. We've got to go back to our nest. It's time to go to sleep. There were no lights. I suppose they had to light torches and lamps and candles. And What's happening? It's night. The sun was darkened. The creator who holds all things together was dying. The sun was dying. All creation was about to die. It was about to be let go and the whole universe would explode. Guess what? Even in death, he had the grip. Because we're still here. It didn't fly apart. Second Peter hasn't happened. The heavens haven't passed away with a great noise. The elements haven't melted with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in have not been burned up. But Peter goes on to say, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth, which will come in which dwelleth righteousness. Wow. Amazing stuff. And what was taking place on Calvary? He kept it closed into the tomb into the depths of hell when he went to preach to the captives and when he came back on Resurrection Sunday, first day of the week. Never let go. I give you that because that's the power that's in us. And what he did on Calvary for us went on beyond the resurrection into all this explanation of what took place at Calvary through Paul's epistle. The great glories and power that accompanied that resurrection. And through it all, through his long suffering, kept it all together. He had it all together, even in death, in resurrection, in ascension, in his coming again. Wow. All this for us really deserve it? I <laughs> have to ask myself, no. But in spite of us, God's true to his promise and will keep us alive and keep us going until it's time.
and then when it's his time to let go of everything we're looking forward to that the rest of the world the philosophers and the traditionalists and everybody else may not be looking forward to him letting go but then guess what new heaven new earth eternity in the heavenlies with him amazing stuff thank you Lord that we had this time for your word for allowing us the opportunity to share together thank you for your great power your great love your great humility and allowing us to have faith that we might be with you forevermore we ask it in Christ's name amen we need another hymn it's after 12 so